Okay, sports soon, Ray. Okay, okay sports soon, Ray. Okay. Oh, hello, Natasha. Hi there. Hi, yeah, uh, I think you've got to mute your, um, your speaker, and that's where you get an echo. Okay, yeah, if everyone could uh, switch their mics off, and um, all those switch their speakers on, sorry. Be great to hear. Okay, how are we looking? Am I okay to start? Okay, great. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain this setup a bit more um, in a moment. Um, I'm just going to go straight ahead. And uh, first slide uh, is my dissertation title. Um, this is, I'm going to ignore the sound installation you saw for the first half of this talk and then go back onto it because obviously the people in the virtual world haven't seen that. For those in the virtual world, that um, everyone here physically has just seen a five-minute uh, binaural sound installation, um, which I'll explain more in a moment. Um, so first slide, um, coding consciousness, transhumanist is aesthetics in, or aesthetics in performance. Um, so this is the first introductory slide, and these are the points I'm going to look at. The first one is uh, the context of the practical dissertation, um, a little bit of background on mind uploading and whole brain emulation, what I mean by coding consciousness, uh, what I mean by transhuman aesthetic, and Natasha, I'm sure you have, um, you'll sure be able to argue um, your definition of transhuman aesthetic, and uh, fingers crossed the Q&A, um, hopefully we could discuss that. Um, today's Mind Uploaders, so where the science fiction becomes a science fact, and how to communicate all these issues through live art and performance, because I do a theatre degree. Um, <laughs> next slide. Okay, I just want to start off by saying I'm uh, shooting myself in the foot, because I'm attempting to give two talks, and I realise it's a work in progress talk, but I found out the other day that this actual talk isn't marked, the progress is marked. So I thought, why not just do a big talk about transhumanism? So here we are. Um, so I'm attempting to give two talks, one to sort of neuroscientists, uh, psychology lecturers, thank you, Dr. John Pickering, for attending, um, artists and performers, fellow students and fellow uh, lecturers. And basically, with a topic like transhumanism, I suppose um, the question everyone's asking is, what can they learn from a 21-year-old theatre and performance studies? Student. Well, I'm hoping you can learn an interdisciplinary approach, and I'm hoping you'll also learn that the body is a phantom, and therefore the foot doesn't exist, and I haven't shot myself in it. Okay, the context. Um, I just want to talk about my present research, and then secondly, how this is going to manifest as performance, and I'll, I'll bring in my work in progress talk. You can come in if you like. Come in. Come in, yeah. Cool. Sorry, there's no chair, guys. You're going to have to stand. Um, okay, so basically I'm a, a Warwick Uni student and I want to make a solo performance piece and I'm doing a solo dissertation and this is my work in progress talk and um, basically I am keen for this talk to be grounded in the techno-social discourse of today so it's not going to be some weird science fiction sort of neuromancer talk there'll be elements of but hopefully I'll be able to ground it for everyone um, and I just want to explain this sort of first couple of um, steps of uploading and explain that to you and the concepts behind my piece before we sort of go on to explain the, the work in progress. Okay, so for everyone in the virtual world, um, this is what everyone has just seen. Um, the slides have gone. Um, uh, yeah, the slides have gone. You should uh, the projection back again. Okay, no worries. Okay, are we all good? Back. Brilliant. Okay. Okay, so for everyone, uh, for the benefit of people in the virtual world, this is what uh, everyone in the physical world has just seen. 
Uh, that's my sound installation. It's dark in here, and I can hear things. And I'll go on to contextualize this before I explain um, the piece and how I hope to develop the piece, which is the important thing. Um, I'd just like to now sort of reference Teleplace and say that this is going to be a performative lecture um, by the fact that I'm giving it also in a virtual world and to what element of performance is my avatar performing in a virtual world and am I performing to you now and we can have that sort of performative debate. Um, and I just want to say, I just want to borrow a Terence McKenna quote which uh, Terence McKenna said, telepathy exists and telepathy is a transfer, a transfer of thoughts from my brain into your brain. Well, I like to say digital telepathy exists because the transfer of thoughts from my brain into your brain through the minute vibrations of the air which go down the microphone out into the virtual world into ones and zeros and appear in telespace. So by using telespace, I'd like to argue that I'm uh, augmenting my geolocation. Uh, it's, telespace is a meta place and um, I can use it to sort of transcend where I am now and give this talk over multiple locations. So to explain my title, Coding Consciousness, uh, I'll, I'll explain the first element first. Coding Consciousness refers to mind uploading, whole brain emulation, downloading, porting of consciousness, whole brain emulation. So a mind uploading 101, or as it is in binary, 010010, you get the idea. So mind uploading or whole brain emulation, sometimes called mind transfer, is the hypothetical process of scanning and mapping a biological brain in detail and copying its state into a computer system or another computational device. Uh, the computer would then have to run a simulation model so faithful to the original that it would behave essentially in the same uh, way as the original brain, or for practical purposes, uh, indistinguishably. The simulated mind is assumed to be part of a virtual reality simulated world supported by a simplified body simulation model. Alternatively, the simulated mind could be assumed to reside in a computer uh, or connected to a humanoid robot or a biological body replacing its brain. This definition is, of course, from Wikipedia. And I just want to assure my lectures now that not all my quotes are from Wikipedia. Um, so this is from my dissertation proposal, and this is what I kind of want to look at. This is, uh, coding consciousness represents both the great challenge and the great limitation of technology. My aim is to look at how performance can transcend these current technological limitations and utter suggestions as to the creative application of life without boundaries, creating a mind free to transcend positional limits by embodying technology. So who or what is uploaded? What becomes the original? Is the uploaded entity the same person? And I hope I haven't lost anyone just yet. <laughs> um, we're basically talking about porting of our consciousness into computers. Uh, so the first question you kind of have to ask is, uh, who am I? And that doesn't refer to Jackie Chan's who am I, although I quite like the quote, fight now, ask questions later, which is kind of how this, uh, this presentation, I hope, will pan out. Um, so here's who I am. Um, I, 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 take the, I took the name under... Um, yeah, you'll find more about morphological identity in this, this talk, but I took the name Luke Robert Mason. I use my middle name simply because I'm Googleable that way. If you Google Luke Mason, you'll find some other guy. If you Google Luke Robert Mason, you, you'll only find me. So that's my, my digital identity. There's 1,505 photos of me. I've got 1,000, uh, uh, 1,198 friends. I'm male. Uh, I was born on the 25th of September, 1989. My brother's called Adam Mason. My father's Alistair Mason. Interestingly, my mother doesn't have Facebook. She also doesn't have a laptop, doesn't have a phone, and doesn't drive. So yeah, when it comes to technology, my mum is useless. Um, I'm also uh, single, interested in women. Uh, looking for a relationship. The yeah, current location is actually wrong. Um, hometown Dartford, religious views, possibly, and read David Eagleman's sum. It will become, um, it will explain itself. Um, my bank number, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, I consider myself from South East London, uh, currently living in Canley. There's my telephone number minus the two digits, and there's a couple of email addresses there. So that's who I am digitally. So we return to sort of this phrase, which is always thrown up when people do the existential, who am I? I think, therefore I am. Well, I'm thinking all these things about me, and I know all these things about me that I've put on my Facebook and put in a digital realm. Therefore, is that me? Are your thoughts who you are? What is the importance of thoughts and memory? So the next slide is why upload. So why this, this urge to explore mind uploading uh, as a concept, a science fiction concept. It, hopefully we can bring it back down to earth in a minute. Um, or 
arguably science fiction concept. Um, my upload, well firstly maybe to protect their brains and keep their minds awake um, for morphological identity. If we could upload our brains into a computer, could we explore multiple identities? Uh, and also radical life extension. Now the transhumanist, um, transhumanist idea is, uh, ideas are uh, around, and please correct me if I'm wrong in the virtual world, are around, uh, or one element of them, are radical life extension. Um, so we need to first sort of look at um, uh, transhumanist aesthetics in performance, the second part of my uh, title. Now the idea of transhuman aesthetics um, is also not so clear and I'm sure this is going to be, be a debate which is going to be um, thrown out in the virtual world and it'll be interesting for debate in the physical world about what we define as transhuman aesthetics and I want to explore transhuman aesthetics through performance, live art and installation work. So what do I think a transhuman aesthetic is? Um, well it's not post-humanism is something I kind of want to push. Um, whether that's right or wrong, we'll find out in a minute. Um, but post-humanism is very much a state. And it's argued when do we become post-human, whereas transhumanism is the traveling. Uh, we're constantly transhuman, transcending ourselves, um, augmenting our bodies with technology. I also want to stress that uploading is not just transhumanism. I know my focus of my talk is um, on uploading and whole brain emulation, but that's not the only thing that transhumanism covers. Um, it's a quote here uh, to describe transhumanism. Transhumanism, transhumanism is the um, uh, psychological, cultural, and political, uh, philo philosophical, here we go. A transhumanism is a philosophical, cultural, and political movement which holds that the human species is now only in a comparatively early stage and that its very evolution will be altered by developing technologies. Future humans will, in effect, be very unlike their current incarnation in both physical and mental capacities. And despite its science fiction-like flavor, and uh, I'd like to stress that if it does feel like a science fiction talk, hopefully we can bring it back down to Earth in a minute. Um, the issues that transhuman present, uh, transhumanism presents deserve to be taken seriously. So this is a work by uh, an artist who's in the virtual space at the moment, uh, Natasha Vita Moore. And, um, it's a conceptual piece. And one of the things I think um, when I say sort of transhuman aesthetic is that it's got to be conceptual. It's talking about the future, possibilities. Um, and this is an annotated diagram of a body suggesting um, body enhancement. Interesting, uh, interestingly, uploading sort of uh, doesn't look so much at the body, but the rejection of the body and the focus on the mind. And hopefully I can go on to explain that uh, more. So is transhumanism all about anticipation of the future? Um, it, is it so attractive because of this um, want for the future? And that's Ian Roberts' mobile phone again. Uh, <laughs> um, OK, Richard Doyle says, within uploading discourse, uh, this anticipation of the materiality of simulation, not what software is, but what, uh, what it con uh, contingently is capable of becoming, shatters the present and disorient, disorients identity. Also, Richard Doyle says, the anticipated body of the upload is not simply an occlusion or amputation of the body and its contingencies. It is a promised body, one summoned but not completed by the simulacrum. So hopefully I haven't lost anyone <laughs> yet. And there's layers and layers of this. And hopefully it will become clearer and clearer as we go on. So. Um, the question I think maybe I should ask it so at this point is, is the, um, the I yesterday the same as the I today if we look at how we define our identities by what's in our brain, what's in our memories. So how are we plugging ourselves in today? And this is where it flies back down to earth and becomes science fact or sci-fi as I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to coin. So we're running Brain 1.0. Uh, we're still designed for running around, killing stuff with spears. And essentially, your body could be seen as a transportation system for the much more important organ, your brain. And we don't have a user guide for the brain. We were just given this piece of hardware, and we've got this software running inside the brain, which is consciousness. And we don't have a user guide of how to use this. And some people have tried to create a user guide, but I don't want to get onto a theological debate. 
The thing we do know is that we're not designed for 58 emails a day and for 24 Facebook notifications a day, 124 Twitter posts a day, and we all know that Twitter usually isn't prepared for the amount of times that we post. So if we see the brain as hardware, can we see the mind and our consciousness as software? And I'll, I'll be interested in sort of arguing this and bringing up a debate uh, following the talk. Thus, if the brain is software, can we emulate it on other machines? Could we download our, our mind onto a, a Mac? I'm going to favor Mac over PC, um, quite biasly. So the first thing we need to look at, and um, it's kind of at the back of uh, everyone's head, is the mind, body, project your body. Um, I'm going to use the Neuromancer quote, so I'm trying to get into science facts and straight back into sci-fi. Uh, the body was meat, case for With uploading and the idea that we are our patterned identity, what is in our mind, the body is at stake, pun intended. Um, Scott, uh, uh, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong in pronouncing, but book at, Atman. Uh, it was quoted as saying, is, in contemporary fiction and philosophy, the body has been successfully, if not simultaneously, addicted to, um, infected by, and wired into electronic systems. And Bernard Wolf in uh, the science fiction book Limbo says, the human skin is an artificial boundary. The world wanders into it, and the self wanders out. So this is a quote that was in the uh, sound installation. Um, your own body is a phantom, one that your brain has con uh, temporarily constructed purely for your own convenience. And um, I'd like to argue this uh, through sort of a, I think it's a psychology experiment um, that was done. And I'd like to argue that the body is an ongoing construct and it can be changed by technology. The psychology experiment is the rubber hand experiment. Um, if anyone's heard of this, uh, basically you have a screen and you put your real hand here and you look at a rubber hand and both are stroked at the same time. And you quite easily believe that the plastic rubber hand is part of your body. And there's been further sort of experiments with this and they realize that the, the real hand loses body temperature and we actually adopt this rubber hand. So we can quite easily adopt all the technology that we run around with in everyday life as part of our body and is important to us. And it'll be interesting to see how many people here have uh, iPhones, Blackberries, Android phones on them right now. We know that a couple have been going off, and you know, everyone is the everyday cyborg. We're, we're connected. So DNA, that's part of the body. Um, and of, often DNA is uh, used as the illusion for the coded body. Uh, we are our DNA, our Gattaca. We can be coded. Now, uh, yes, that's important. Our body can be coded through DNA. However, are we more than our DNA? And there's uh, Sebastian Sung, uh, Sung uh, TED Talk, which I'd recommend watching, which says, uh, are you your connectome? Are you your site of memory? And interestingly, the site of memory has fostered a forgetting of corporeality. Could we take what's in here and live forever in a machine? OK, so the idea of coded. Um, and what do I mean by the coded brain? Um, well, hopefully uploading will broken new alignments of information, bodies, and subjectivity, and render not by loss, but by transformation. Basically, transcendence. Can we transcend ourselves by taking what we have in here and allowing it to live out there forever? And this, thanks postmodernism, has allowed for a disillusion, disappearance, and implosion of the body. Postmodernism is useful for some things. And there's uh, narratives of terminal flesh. And um, in a lot of science fiction and a lot of the uh, texts that are written about this, um, it devalues the experience of the body merely by focusing on virtual realities. So the fact that I'm here physically talking to you now doesn't stop me from being in a telebase talking at the same time. You know, I didn't need to physically be here. Could that little thing run around with my mind and with my thoughts in its mind? So, again, focusing on code, code is coming to function as the transcendental, unifying, and ideal substance of life for the non-referential, the unmediated, while at the same time it retains attributes of the, or a trace, if you will, of writing, replacing the body with a less mortal letter. 
the um, the one thing that's sort of uh, concerning is um, if we're just code and if we're just DNA, um, does that kind of devalue our bodies, devalue our identity, de devalue us as as people or our importance? So what I'm looking at really is um, something that Hans Moravec calls patterned identity. And so this can be argued of, is it the human and his or her brain, or is it the brain and his or her human who is controlling what? Well, we have, uh, we, we were allowed to foster morphological identities, which were allowed, uh, means our brain allows us to be more than one person outside our body, transcending our body. And this has been explored um, today in things like Second Life, and, uh, and you're exploring it right now, and hopefully uh, the next couple of slides will explain how. Now we've always been porting what's in our brain to an external source. The technology, the wonderful technology of uh, pen and paper, be a diary, we're placing our memories in an external source and keeping those memories externally from our body, external symbolic um, storage. We're externalizing our minds through the technology of uh, ink and paper. Um, Merlin Donald in Origin of the Mo a Modern Mind um, says we're permanently wedded to external sources of memory. Uh, it's, it's an external symbolic affair, no longer in the human brain or body. So external hardware and software supports uh, now uh, so external hardware and software supports now routinely give human beings effective cognitive abilities that in many respects far outstrip those of the biological brain. And again, what are these? Well, there are avatars in Second Life. Um, the avatar I'm using in Teleplace. Um, you may have seen uh, Stellark's video of uh, the body is obsolete. Well, there's my very poor... Um, so a 3D rendering of my face. And uh, I recommend you do it because you look hilarious without hair. Um, so I want to now take, uh, you've, you've had all the science fiction, I hope I haven't lost too many of you. I now want to take a pragmatic look and look at the ideology uh, behind this, which is being proved in our everyday interactions with technology. Uh, what we have now in the 21st century. So the sci-fi is becoming the sci-fi, the science fact. Uh, this is an example of early identity, uh, early identity transfer, and this is happening already through uh, Second Life, um, through not so much maybe Telesplace because I'm physically here and I'm streaming this, but in Second Life you're free to be whoever you want to be. Um, and you can, you know, for, for all you know, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you my Second Life name, I could be a transvestite called Trudy on Second Life, and it's still part of me, it's still part of my identity. I'm not a transvestite called Trudy on Second Life. Um, interestingly, with this, uh, with this avatar, um, the hair was extra. You had to pay for the hair. So um, we'll get on to sort of uh, commodification of the body um, in a bit. But um, that sort of kind of sums it up in that, in that image there. Okay, so this is the internet. Uh, this is a picture from the OOT, uh, I may have pronounced that wrong, OOT uh, project. And it's the internet that have allowed us to have multiple identities. Are you the same person now as you are in Facebook, or on Second Life, or in a virtual world, or in uh, World of Warcraft, or any of these other um, multiplayer games? There's been a phrase uh, called coming out in cyberspace. And it's not so much uh, referring to sort of uh, coming out in the sort of homosexual term, but coming out as in you're allowed to be whoever you want to be in a virtual world. But that's still part of you, still part of what's going on in here. Um, uh, Kunstner in 2004 said, the feeling of security is mediated by the very nature of interactions online, which are based on the complicated gains of anim anonymity, it's one of those words, I knew that was going to, uh, and intimacy, privacy and disclosure. In the case of closeted gays and lesbians, for example, cyberspace can provide an opportunity to meet like-minded uh, and perform one's sexuality all but virtually, while remaining anonymous. Um, he has used sort of um, homosexuality as the basis for that, but I'm saying you can be whatever you want. To be. You can be a bunnykin or something in Second Life. You can run around as an animal, or uh, or more challengingly, a, a two, three-year-old, um, or a six, seven-year-old kid. Uh, I recommend watching Life 2.0. Uh, 
which is a film that's recent, recently been released about people living these sort of virtual lives and really believing these virtual lives. So the importance of ubiquitous technology and how that's helping us to upload our minds today. Well, these are wonderful things. Uh, we're all connected. Uh, this is our appendage, and there's this wonderful thing where people are getting, um, uh, it's, it's like uh, phantom vibrations. They're, they're walking down the street without their phone, and they're, parts of their body are vibrating because they believe that their phone's on them. So back to the rubber hand experiment, these are becoming integrated into our bodies, although not physically yet in our bodies. Um, they soon well uh, could be. Interestingly, Greg Egan um, has written a, sto a short story called... Uh, He's a science fiction writer, and in his book, Axiomatic, he's written a, a short story called Longing to Be Me, where he describes something called the jewel, which is emplaced uh, in your brain, and it mimics all your thoughts. And it's, uh, it's hardware, and it mimics all your thoughts. And soon you get your brain scooped out, and the jewel carries on as you. So, you know, if I die, could you put this in my head, and I could phone everyone from beyond the grave? That'd be kind of exciting. There we go. <laughs> Greg Egan's axiomatic. A small computer is inserted into the brain at birth that monitors its activity in order to learn how to mimic its behavior. By the time one reaches adulthood, the dual simulation is a near-perfect predictor of the brain's activity, and the dual is given control of the person while the redundant brain is discarded. Um, could we become hardware? Okay, mind uploading. There's an app for that. Uh, I hope so. Um, this idea of ubiquitous technology, Andy Clark uh, describes it as uh, as our worlds become smarter and get to know us better and better, it becomes harder and harder to say where the world stops and where the person begins. Um, basically, he's talking about the fact that we're, our everyday uh, interactions with technology are sort of blurring these boundaries and blurring abstraction. And there was an interesting discussion um, which uh, is pulled out in Richard Doyle's uh, book, Living in Post-Vital Times, um, where he quotes a discussion on cryonet. Uh, and it's discussion 5310. And I just thought this was quite interesting in light of the, uh, the economic crisis. It goes, I've never had a real job. Work consists of false times distance. I do some work on a keyboard, but it's a negligible amount. My employer could save money by replacing me with a steam engine, which would press all the keys with a greater force through greater distance, more often thus doing far more work than I ever did. Actually, this wouldn't save them any money at all, as they never pay me any money. They only give me pieces of paper that have little pictures of the Queen on them. Come to think of it, they don't even do that. They give me pieces of paper which tell me that numbers in a bank computer somewhere have been incremented. Which is silly because numbers can't be in a computer as numbers aren't actually, uh, as numbers are an abstraction. Actually, they merely change the state of magnetization of various tiny areas of the disk belonging to a bank. Why should I do real work for that? We're living in abstraction now. Everything we do, we, we think we're not interacting digitally and we are. And it'd be great to have sort of a debate about that. It's interesting um, how we're sort of trading on abstraction and hello economic. Crisis. Um, this is another one. Uh, I think differently. This is this is done by designer Paul uh, Micarelli. Uh, I may have pronounced all these names wrong. Um, this is a symbiosis neural interface. It's a conceptual piece again. Uh, my argument is that transhumanist art is conceptual. Uh, this symbiosis neural interface will hook up your mind and computer, working together as one. It will feature an Intel Fusion Quantium processor that compu uh, computes the literal speed of thought while holographic data storage options uh, ensues you to have a virtual unlimited storage space. Um, that would be cool to have, because it's got an Apple symbol on it. Um, OK, so how are we update, uh, uploading our minds right now, today? Well, how many of you here have Facebook? Hey, 21st century mind uploaders. Everything that you place on Facebook is part of your identity. Your memories, you place photos on Facebook. Those are your memories. You're porting this into a digital realm. And we all have these Facebooks. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, um, you may have heard of the Turin experiment, where they try and trick whether it's a computer or a person talking to someone. I'm interested in, after 75 years of you interacting with that little app there, um, if your Facebook could boot up and uh, talk back to you, or talk back to your friends after you're dead, 
And your friends will believe that honest interaction. Because it knows the way you speak, because the way you do Facebook updates, it knows your geolocational data, so it knows where you've been, and it can aggregate all that data and basically pretend to be you. Um, which is kind of a kind of a scary, scary thought. Don't all go home and I lose about 20 friends on Facebook, that'll kill me. Um, everyone deletes me on Facebook. Um, actually, this slide is why you should delete me on Facebook. Um, this is a CSV, um, which is a comma separated value, which, uh, do it, anyone can do it. Just go on your Facebook, uh, just fire up this app, and it will basically give you a printout of all the information that your friends are making available to you. Basically, I've ripped here just people's name and uh, their gender. But you can rip everything. And remember these unique identifier numbers, because uh, when you want to go and get your Facebook off of Mark Zuckerberg, in a couple of years' time, he's not going to ask for your name. He's going to ask for the unique identifier number. And they give it to you on a USB stick the size of that. And you can install that in your brain and you'll have your memories back. It'll be great. Um, interesting, has anyone seen? Um, <laughs> this is just a fun experiment. I just love technology. Um, have you seen The Island, the film The Island? Has anyone seen that with Ewan McGregor? Um, there we go. <laughs> Audience interaction. Um, in the film The Island with Ewan McGregor, there's a scene where uh, these sort of clones have memories downloaded into them. Um, and he's lying on this bed and he has photos of the, the guy he's, he's being cloned as, uh, sort of memories flashing in front of his face. Now go home and uh, preload the 1,500 Facebook pictures you have of you into your computer and just press the side button and skip through them all because it would be like your life flashing before you. It's absolutely fantastic as a game. But you know, could you, could all these information, all these tagged photos, how much of that is you? I mean, we're talking base technology now. You know, mind uploading is this futurist idea and I'm talking about how it's happening uh, right now, even if the technology is uh, simplified. So digital indoctrination, this makes me laugh, I love this. Um, People tweeting their uh, people tweeting their kids, um, and you know, part of me there's something inside me which kind of goes, I wish my parents tweeted about me um, in first person, which is crazy, because you, you you get these parents who create you know Facebook pages which they link up with babies' Flickr account, and they're going just burped, lol, um, and this is fantastic. But you can have your whole all these memories that you forget, uh, you can just log on to your, your baby Twitter and find out. But this, is a, this is a project that's been done where uh, when the baby kicks, um, kicks the mother, it sends a notification uh, straight to Twitter. So you're, you're digital even beyond birth, which is kind of, a, kind of a scary idea. And this whole idea of parents creating a unique digital ide identities, like I take Luke Robert Mason, so I'm instantly Googleable. Google a little blah, blah, blah. That's another, that's another difficult word. Um, there's parents selecting their baby's names on the basis of if, you know, if I had a kid, a little boy, and called him Alfie, if Alfie.co.uk wasn't available, I wouldn't call him Alfie. I'd call him Tazar Mason, because TazarMason.co.uk is available, and the same with Twitter. You know, they're picking unique identities digitally um, straight from birth. Um, I'm also kind of interested in uh, um, the idea of the digital bar mitzvah. It's kind of when do you hand over all this stuff? When do you sort of go, you know, you're old enough now, and set your passwords, enjoy your Facebook, enjoy your Twitter. Um, yeah, that's kind of a kind of a scary idea to me. Um, interesting, you, you can sort of do this. If your parents had a video camera, um, and I know uh, Tim's got a Super 8 uh, capture desk, so you, they probably filmed on that, and on this HD DV, H, the hard drive cameras. You can go, go and capture all your baby uh, footage and just explore it. And in, uh, you know, I did a <laughs> did a video art piece called Pedo. Um, it's, it's, it's not anything to do with pedophilia, but it was basically just re-edited bits of my childhood. And it was weird looking at a kid who was you, but not connecting with those memories. And you were looking as external gaze mediated by the camera. Um, it was kind of a weird experience. So it was kind of multi-layered that that video piece. So another two. Uh, ways in which this facial recognition thing is useless at the moment. Another two ways in which we're sort of um, uh, becoming digital is this uh, ident uh, identifying, defying, identity defining technologies. Um, 
And it's interesting that we will allow this to happen simply because we think it's so useful. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give either argument in terms of um, if it's good or bad. But interestingly, who would have, you know, thought of telling everyone exactly where they are at every moment until they made it in a, into a game? Um, and the same with sort of facial recognition, you know, like uh, Facebook is doing this now. If you upload five photos of all your mates, it will find all the friends who are similar and uh, basically place them uh, together and you can tag them with one tag. Um, the interesting thing is uh, that we'll get onto this, but who owns that data? And uh, considering there's, you know, 1,500 photos of you tagged on Facebook at every single angle, all they need is that information and they could do a 3D model of your face like I did. Uh, and that was just with three photos. <laughs> So 1,500, they, they could get you from the back and all sorts of places. Um, so we're all scared of this simply because of the bad robot meme. Uh, transhumanism gets a bad rap um, by the movies. We're all scared of sort of, oh, Terminator, ah, if we upload this stuff and you know, we create these robots and they become intelligent, they kill us all, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I'd like to just argue that it just makes good stories and that's why they do it. Um, and we're also kind of scared of this, 1984. Um, but we'll accept it because of that. Augmented ID, what I was saying about facial recognition. When that bit of technology comes out and you could look at someone and their Facebook will be floating above them and their Twitter will be floating to the side. And if you go to a networking event and everyone's got this technology and you don't have it, you're left out. Everyone has to catch up. Why have we all got Facebook? You know, because we all wanted that technology because everyone else has got it. And imagine that. And you'll be signing up to go into a booth and get your whole face scanned simply because you can do that and not have to give out business cards, which would save the environment. Um, so it's a weak argument. Um, so there's this movement, no to ID, uh, stop the database state. And you know, I don't want to get into these arguments um, just yet until the sort of Q&A. And yeah, OK, this is, who owns this data is important, I suppose. Um, and interesting, the line between sort of technology and politics is purely economic. Um, th these guys are sort of talking about, um, kind of back to my mum and being, oh, are we okay? Bleeped. Um, kind of back to my mum and sort of, when I share this stuff with her, and she doesn't get my degree full stop, she's like, yeah, okay, it's lovely. Um, when I share this stuff with her, she goes, oh, I don't have a digital ID, it'll be fine. I went, mum, like child benefit numbers and, you know, the bank account numbers, and you have these digital identities, whether you like it or not, you may not be in fa on Facebook, thank God. But, you know, you could be, I hope she's not in Second Life, that would be scary. Um, and uh, these guys basically argue that you should go and get this digital information. Um, they've sort of got this neo-Marxist thing of we should do it in this big foul swoop and the governments won't be able to deal with it and release all this data. And they say you should take a top-down and bottom-up approach by using the Freedom of Information Act and the public access right. Because um, we have ad hoc databases created about us all the time. But at the moment, you know, we haven't had, we haven't had 1984. So uh, I suppose all this data is quite useful when I go to an ATM. Um, has my questions for me debate? Please sit. Uh, oh, he's heading out. No worries. Um, sorry, so this hasn't happened yet, so maybe we should be all right. And when I go to my ATM, um, all my money's there, so good. Um, oh, skip forward. Blast. Um, <laughs> So will technology inform social change? And what I mean is, you know, we've adopted these. We all walk around with these um, to an extent. Um, I think, Nicholas, you don't. Nicholas Weibrow, 8-bit generation. There we go. <laughs> um, all of us walk around with these, these iPhones and these Blackberries. And, you know, the future of technology is the technology we, we have right now. And I don't want to use a Star Trek um, illusion, but interestingly, in Star Trek, if you remove the technology, the um, the social constructs are still the same. Um, I don't believe that's quite uh, right now because the way we act socially now with these, you know, pieces of devices are totally different from how we were act acting um, even a couple of years ago. Um, and I've, I've blown it. <laughs> Uh, so will we all use this internet for this wonderful identity thing, or will we just use it to look at pictures of cats? Um, and I think there's, there's something on Facebook at the moment called Cute War, and I just want to shamelessly crowbar this one in. Um, so there it is. That's my Cute War, um, cute war uh, offer. Um, 
So yeah, we well, have to look at these these other arguments, which um, are often raised by a guy called Jaron and Lanier, and those two arguments are economics and the lived experience. So who owns all this data? Well, Google's got this thing about don't be evil, um, and you know it's kind of scary if what if Facebook starts selling off all the data it's got on you and all the photos it's got on you. Um, uh, okay, um, Douglas Turnbull in a science fiction book uh, Brainstorm actually just goes head on with this and um, basically says that we could sign up and buy a memory experience and have a memory experience and borrow memories from people um, if we could port it into a, a digital uh, realm. The other issue is, are we missing the moment by recording being modern day mind uploaders? The fact that we go around recording everything and taking photos of this, and this is a photo of um, it's Obama visiting somewhere or other, and everyone is not experiencing the moment, but they're taking photographs of the moment. Um, I mean, that's great if you think you're, you know you store this somewhere and you die, and then they can reboot you, and you can have all these happy memories. But um, I mean, right now, do you think that's going to happen in the next? Uh, 50, 60, 70 years, well, <laughs> that debate we can have. Um, so back to the usefulness of art, and I'm doing a theatre degree, so that's crowbar, theatre and performance straight back in. Um, in. In sort of stuff like this, are the debates of the usefulness of art dead? Um, should we be looking at art and design as an opportunity to lead visionary ideas for the future? Um, but to do that, artists ha and designers need to think uh, about the future first. And hopefully today, I've put little memes of future thinking into all of you, and you'll walk away and explore you know, what have you got on Facebook, and do a CSV and laugh at all the information you can get of your, off your friends. So this is my quote. <laughs> and one key is to sit your, stick your own quote in a, uh, in a presentation. Um, but this is what I want to do. This is uh, the piece I want to create. Uh, the experience I want to create. I wanted to utilize today's technology to extrapolate and explore future technologies with an eye to foregrounding their social impacts. So hopefully that's kind of succinct everything that I've been on about. So click here to upload your soul is the experience that I want to create. Um, sign up, click here to upload your soul. I hate using the word soul and it has a lot of, sort of religious connotations with it. Um, and. Uh, Cartesian mind body splits all over the place, but um, this was a is a quote in reference to something they thought BT were doing called the Soul Catcher Project, um, and one of the articles was uh, click here to upload your soul, uh, which sounded ominous. Um, so my work in progress, um, sort of now after contextualising the whole whole thing, um, what is my work in progress, and where do I want to go, and from what you've just seen, what do I want to go on to? Um, for people in the virtual world, I created a binaural experience um, using uh, a sound piece. It was only five minutes, a sound piece and some quotes um, about mind uploading. And it was a binaural sound installation with the attempt to remove the senses. And by removing at least one of your senses, it attempted to create a crude virtual reality informed by your brain. And what I mean by that is you've got an, a sort of uh, illusion of space and of movement by the fact that the sound was moving, or at least I hope you did. Uh, by the fact that the sound was moving around the room. It was basically a crude sound uh, VR. Uh, something I didn't look at in there, and I want to go on to look at, is embodying other identities and tricking the mind, um, and sort of maybe looking at access um, to uh, digital data. But ultimately, what I want to look at is what would it feel like to be uploaded? Uh, how are we already uploading our digital selves uh, through our everyday interactions with technologies? Um, this one, the, the sort of access to digital data and embodying other identities, sort of in my work in progress, um, talks with Tim. He suggested maybe Facebook stalking someone and sort of revealing to them how much information is about them online, which is still kind of uh, interesting. But I'm sure I'm going to have to fill in loads of ethics forms for that, and I'm not sure I'm prepared prepared to do that. And please don't go home and delete me off Facebook if you're not doing it on your BlackBerry already. Um, so I just love this. I want to buy a whole bunch of these and use these. Um, this kind of encompasses um, encompasses the, the sort of 
project that I want to create. You get another identity, you put it into a computer, and you experience that identity. It's an, an experience. But I'm also interested in sort of the idea of sensory deprivation, uh, removal of the body, and the focus on the mind. So there you didn't have any, well, you didn't have anything in that room apart from the, the sound. And, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of look at maybe suspending people in sensory deprivation tanks and putting sounds in them, uh, to them, um, suspending people, um, just to see what would it feel like to have a disembodied body. And because it's cool. Um, okay. So the future development of my work. Um, so, okay, science fiction is important. Um, it, it operates in a dangerous liminal zone. But where do I go from here? And this is kind of where I want your help. And this is where I want to use this work in progress talk. And I just want you to sort of, if you can, take in everything that you've just seen and sort of tell me the piece that you want to experience or what you think would be interesting exploring or the thing that sort of you know, snapped with you and you went, oh, why don't you, why don't you go down that route a little more? Or if you've got any books or things you think I should read, you know, especially in the virtual world, I, uh, just tell me. I just want to know because um, I'm still researching and still finding out and sort of, you know, how far do you want to go down the rabbit hole uh, with this topic. So just um, to sum up, uh, thank you to Ian O'Donoghue, who's uh, a technician who uh, allowed me to use his, his Macs that he's very precious of. Um, Andrew Reed and Kate Pierce, who were the voice artists in the piece, Tim White, my supervisor. Uh, Dr. Eamon Swyman, uh, who's come up from UCL today, who speaks on sort of, um, uh, it's, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's sort of extreme simulation scenarios and mind uploading. Um, Dr. John Pickering, who I think had to leave early, um, who is here. Um, Dr. Steve Fuller, who unfortunately couldn't be here, he's in Morocco, but he's, he's been a brilliant support and his enthusiasm is powerful. Uh, Anna Dimitri. Uh, who's an artist friend down in Sussex, who's been brilliant, sort of helping me or pointing me in the right direction to artists. Um, uh, Gilio, Gilio, or Gilio, I'm very sorry for mispronouncing your name in the virtual world uh, for the use of his uh, tele space, uh, tele place. I'd also like to thank um, Zykogen and um, uh, used to it. <laughs> I uh, used to people mispronouncing his name. And also the, the band uh, Zycogen, and I recommend going and checking out their website if you like the piece of music I uh, used. And Eamon, um, under his morphological identity, Eamon Zero, is in a band, and they created me some music for my Roots Fun piece, and I just sort of ripped five minutes of that to use in there, because uh, it's got a great bass, and it can sort of really, um, really create that effect. Um, so yeah, anyway, <laughs> question and answer session. Um, any questions? Um, I'm sure there are loads. Or anything you can tell me, um, or anything you want me to explore. Um, can I just sort of lay down some rules as to how we're going to do this, basically for the people in the virtual world? If you do have a question, um, I'm going to give you the microphone. Can you speak it into the microphone? Um, for those with questions in the virtual oh, actually, I might as well talk to the camera. Uh, for those with questions in the virtual world, um, could you use the text chat and put uh, capital letter Q and then whether your question is a sound question or a text question. And then I'll have a look at who wants to ask questions. And we'll try and put you through the PA system. Um, but first, I'm going to ask questions of the physical audience. And then we'll, um, then we'll try and see an experiment if you guys can ask questions. So uh, the capital letter Q followed by whether it's sound or text. Um, uh, can you show the people? Uh, the five minute sound, I'm going to record that. And you can listen to that as a binaural piece with headphones, and I'll release that on the web, and I'll give you guys some links. Uh, Luke, do you think the same person who went to sleep last night and so Do you think you were the same person who... Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, okay, basically, cue and then text or audio, and if we can sort of, if there are any questions, get a microphone. Um, anyone want to fire away? Anyone? Sorry, hi, I'm Eamon. Um, actually, the question that just came up was, was interesting. Um, it was just whether or not, so this is forwarding on someone's um, virtual world question. Do you, so you're saying that um, personality, uh, the contents of consciousness evolve with different information you're exposed to, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, and so, so what this person online is asking is whether or not you feel like you're the same person who went to sleep last night. But, you know, and, and that might seem like a strange question to ask, but if you sort of exaggerate it and say, do you feel like you're the same person you were a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, 
And after a while, sooner or later, you're going to hit a threshold where you say, no, well, no, I'm not that guy anymore, I'm not that six-year-old. So where do you draw the line, personally? Well, I mean, if you could upload your sort of consciousness or explore, you can explore multiple identities all at the same time using sort of VR technologies, like Second Life. Um, and what I was saying about sort of the babies tweeting and going back and looking at video of you as a child, you know, are you a different person uh, then as you are now, that patterned identity and how, how that sort of changes? Um, is that sort of answer, answer your question? I mean, well, yeah, I'm no, just curious, because um, I can imagine people who use more, I, I mean, I'm just riffing on what came up online, but um, just I can imagine people who have more of a, a digital um, identity, like people who are into Twitter and that kind of thing, they might feel that um, their identity changes m more rapidly than other people, like your mother. You know, you mentioned your mother, so you know she might have a, a fairly slow-moving evolution of identity. Oh, right, okay. you know. uh, <laughs> um, no, no, yeah, I get, I get your argument, but we, we are. I mean, you know, the, the Facebook statuses we choose. Um, to, all right, to use Facebook as a as a sort of modern example, the, the, you, you see people change almost like uh, as if they're schizophrenics. You know, I've, I've got a friend who, uh, he was going out on a date. I've got a friend. Um, he was going out on a date, and at the beginning of the date, he was, oh, really looking forward to seeing Julie. And, you know, within an hour, you got like, she's a bitch, and I don't <laughs> want to talk to Julie any, anymore. And interestingly, two minutes after that, um, and let's call him John. John has added the Scrabble application. So he de dealt with his, uh, his issues through playing virtual Scrabble. Um, so I suppose, you know, you're constantly changing how you are with people. and performative identity to apply that back to theatre and performance. I mean, you know, we're always performing something that I'm different now as if I was with you in the pub or I, I can see my friend Jasper there. I'd definitely be different with him in the pub. Um, <laughs> so we're constantly diff different identities, but I'm, I'm saying that sort of virtual realities are allowing us to explore multiple identities. If we could upload our consciousness into a machine and live an indefinite amount, then we could explore, you know, we wouldn't constantly be the same person. I'd want to go and do different things. I'd have eternity to explore this little virtual world that I'm, I find myself in, with this little virtual body which is allowing me to have, a, have an illusion of a body. I'll, do, I'll, I'll just say quickly, just, yeah. um, while I've got the mic, um, is just that from my, my line of work and my interests, I'd say that there's a distinction to be drawn between the mechanisms of um, perceptual awareness, consciousness, like, so the stuff that allows you to feel the wind on, on the back of your hand or see red or hear a sound or whatever and the contents of consciousness. So these are the kind of ideas that, um, you know, the kind of stuff you upload to Facebook, your memories, images, that kind of thing. But, um, but like you, I, I think the ability to replicate this stuff is converging and accelerating. So, um, so I think when people talk about consciousness, they're talking about, they can be talking about different things. Yeah, but, but um, so some people might say, oh, you can put all that stuff on Facebook until the end of time, and it won't be me, it won't be conscious. But I can easily imagine that um, over time, converging technologies would mean that the stuff on Facebook is more like a real memory than it is now. Um, you know. I'm saying, you know, what if you yeah. think a tweet without you even interacting? You know, the, mm -hmm. the interface is still, like, you look at interfaces of most computers now, you know, you got you got a mouse and a keyboard. And this is why the iPad was such a big sort of revolutionary thing, because suddenly touches back in technology. Um, and you look at all the stuff you can do on computers now, but we're still using, a, you know, ancient in terms of what we can actually do on the software. Like the brain, you know, is an ancient piece of hardware and all this software that it's potentially running. Uh, we're still using mouse and keyboard. And those are ancient, ancient bits of sort of interface technology. And until so we can sort of run through our computer in a virtual simulation and go and explore files and documents and things. Um, you know, a lot of it is conceptual. I, you know, I said that straight from the off. You know, I, w I want to explore these ideas and I want to create a conceptual piece that sort of looks uh, towards the future but also has an ear for what's happening today so we can ground this. Because otherwise it would just go, ooh, Luke's creating a sci-fi piece, cool. And, uh, you know, that's not what I want to do. Cool. Uh, anyone else in the physical world who has a... There's a question, uh, Simon. Oops. Yeah, I'm losing my cable. There you go. Hello. Oh, yeah. um, okay. Uh, there's there's lots of things in it which I think I very very much appreciate. Um, but you say um, you want to do this with some kind of orientation towards social consequences, yeah. or, or, or uh, how it would be uh, socially coded after it after the event. You know. 
and I think that would be where the uh, the problems come in. Uh, my first um, kind of thought is, you know, is there such a thing as aesthetics which isn't uh, transhuman in a certain way? You know, as if what it is to be a human is an entirely uh, unfluctuating, stable category. You know, I mean, do we imagine that um, uh, w what it meant to be in a human in a certain place and time was the same before and after, say, Dante, or um, or the Greek temple? You know, each each kind of great work of art or aesthetics alters in a certain way the the coordinates of what it means to be a human. So, um, so you know, one initial question would be, you know, what what, what is so different about this break and this intrusion um, to begin with? Um, well, I'd say, I'd say it's uh, kind of looking at um, conceptual technology by looking at what's today and extrapolating trends. So we're going, now looking at it as a real possibility. You know, for example, if you mention this to someone, I'm talking like five, six years ago. They mm -hmm. go, no, nah, no way. You know, I can tweet and do this and all this, and there's an app for what, and you know, I can find a Domino's and order my pay. You know, you wouldn't um, have envisioned this, but now it seems to be moving so quickly. We can start mm -hmm. predicting what's going to come next, and you know, there's, there's people um, who are paid probably quite a lot to write blogs on what's going to come next, so everyone can sort of update um, their trends and sort of look at. Yeah, but the problem is, you know, don't buy the new iPhone because the next one will be coming out. And so and so said this in this blog that this is going to happen. And so just massive intensification of the process. Yeah, intensification. And yeah. we can kind of, by looking at the technology now, we can, with a bit more sort of, um, uh, a bit more definite, look at possi the possible of what might come next. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you're talking, you know, a couple of years back, they could have said, well, oh, maybe this. But, you know, it's such a it's such a slow progression. Um, um, sorry. No, Karen. Um, no, so okay. Um, in terms of the kind of social possibilities and the social co coding, you know, um, uh, what I what I did appreciate and and what it made me think of um, in terms of the uh, potentially liberatory possibilities of this. Yeah. What I appreciate is the kind of contingency of it, you know. How the, do you mean contingency? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll say. All right. Okay, when you say, you know, humanism in trance or post-humanism, I presume what you mean is the period of stability since evolution of the species, um, a period of stability with certain anthropological coordinates, birth, death, love, and so on, which now these new technologies can explode and transcend. Right. Um, and it made me think of, uh, you know, Walter Benjamin and the uh, and, and and his idea of, of of what technology can do to subjectivity, you know, he he has uh, an essay, I, you know, the pun with R R I I, yeah. is a camera, you know, uh, and, and at various points he has he has the metaphor of um, the the artist armed with technology is like a surgeon cutting into reality, and um, you know, so um, by by um, contingency, um, I mean it's not that we're an that uh, were an essential human category, all receiving the same kind of experience. What you can do is use technology to really cut into experience and open up whole new realms of possibility for, for experiencing reality and not to accept just the status quo of what we receive as reality. But also your, your personal experience of reality. Mm -hmm. How do I know my reality is the same as kind of your reality and how I want to express myself digitally? Well, 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 you talk about having several different perspectives yeah. um, digitally, which is exactly what Benjamin is talking about with his with his dialectics. If you can experience things from two different perspectives, you can have some kind of uh, uh, um, more more profound understanding of what's going on in reality. Um, you I know. read that, but I'll give it a look. Sure, well, I'll talk to you afterwards. Um, yeah, no, cheers, I appreciate it. But, okay, but I think the problems come in, like, well, you obviously quote Descartes, uh, Descartes, um, and this seems like the kind of consummation of the Cartesian tradition, you know, the clear divide between mind and body, Descartes withdraws from the body, says all that is essential in me is that I can think. And so what you're saying is that, you know, we, 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 we can codify and upload that onto a, com onto a computer um, and completely do away with the, with the body, and embodiment will dissolve as a concept. Um, but it... I mean, what, the, the sort of the argument is... This, 
if you download into a VR. We need a sensor body. Mm. Um, is the other, you know, counter argument. And the, the idea of the sound installation in there was to actually remove at least one sense, but you still get the idea that there's movement sure. in that room. You've got a sense of something that you're creating mm. here. Um, and you know they're talking about sort of downloading consciousness into little avatars because we need a sense of something. Um, otherwise, you know, it'd go crazy just spinning around on itself. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the the problem which I'm trying to get at is is that is that sense of self. You know, I am. I think. I have some kind of agency. I can act in a certain way. A real, an affirmed kind of modern sense of agency, is a is a historical category. You know, um, it was kind of built upon the the the, the uh, upon social domination in a certain way. I was reading the other day about um, ancient Athens. You know. One kind of affirmed democratic male citizen um, had ten slaves or women who didn't have that full and saturated subjectivity in order to exist. The same with Sparta, you know, they had ten slaves and subjugated peoples for one affirmed warrior, you know. Um, and kind of that has been fought for, and it's a, and it's a potentially emancipatory uh, category, you know, this is where yeah. Marx came from, you know, and to, to post that or to transcend that in a way that would compromise it really would be the end of a world worth fighting for, I think, in that, you know, by, by digitalizing that kind of emancipatory consciousness, what is happening is, uh, I don't know if you know the word, is you're, you're reifying it. By reifying, um, I mean, you're, you're turning it into an, an object which is available for commodification, for exchange, um, uh, I, I see it as a kind of sub subjugation in a certain way, and I, th I think that is potentially dangerous. There, you know, so I'm I'm all for the the kind of open radical possibilities of um, of, 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 of transcendence yeah. of new possibilities, and yet there should be that kind of sense of, yeah. Who of social the absence that runs your mind. You know, and there's this whole thing about uh, this is saving the body, but people who are frozen, cryonics. You know, like mm -hmm. Russia is the biggest place for it, but if Russia runs out of electricity, they're not going to keep the frozen guy on. It's kind of, yeah. you, know, mm -hmm. you paid your insurance policy to allow your body to be mm -hmm. constantly, you know, you can just switch them off. Well, yeah. yeah, and some guy externally, potentially, owns you. And, and so we start, and I'm getting into the realms of science fiction again, firing these things off into space <laughs> so we can go and explore other worlds and from the safety of our VR. But this is kind mm. of science fiction doctrine. Sorry, I screwed the microphone. Can I do one little more? <laughs> um, okay, how do you imagine like kind of eroticism in your like space? I, I say you. It's always you, sex. Back to you, sex. You, oh, you, man. you eradicate. Um, uh, right. Eradicate the body, and we can't fuck yeah. each other. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, um, well, what is eroticism in a certain sense? And love, it's kind of accepting a kind of contingent corporeal yeah. body with all its flaws, and yet yeah. still idealizing it. That, that that's the kind of pulse yeah. of love. I mean, what what are you going to do when when you're a stream of DNA and you yeah. I get a potential lover and I see her. DNA there, I say, you know, if, oh, you have a slight glitch in your data, that, that really gets my motor, you know, uh, uh, how, how does this thing? Um, yeah, I, you know, like, at the end of the day, sort of romanticizing the concept of uh, uh, sort of love and, you know, it's all mm -hmm. hormones and it's all sort of the, these coded things that are going on. Uh, we want to romanticize it and say, oh, this is wonderful thing, I found this wonderful okay. person. Um, so I've just been a reactionary then. But, by. Yeah, no, but okay. you know, could could we code that experience? Could there, there's actually a, I can't remember the science fiction novel, um, but there's a the science fiction novel where you can experience um, different memories and different VRs, and one guy just gets hooked to an orgasm VR, and you see the whole he just plugged happen. into that and he stays there. Um, so it's kind of you know, and people have these relationships <laughs> in Second Life, and these things are. Uh, I'm sure there's some. Uh, Getting into dodgy realms, I'm sure there's some sort of mutual masturbation occurring to yeah. allow that sort of interaction to be as strong as it is. I mean, you look at you go and watch Life 2.0, um, yeah. and you look at this couple who met with a second life and um, sort of the, the the interaction. But the fact is, they've still got a physical body. Um, we don't know what it'll feel like, you know, and that's it's conceptual and trying to trying to explore what it might feel like is part of the piece I want to create. Uh, take one sense out um, and see what it feels like. Mm. What would it feel like to be a disembodied body? 
Yeah. Um, and how can I create that experience for? A, a well, people already do it themselves with kind of blindfolds and things. Yeah, yeah, um, no, yeah. people are you know rubbing um, anaesthetic all over themselves and mm. things. You know, I'm not going to say I'm going to anaesthetize anyone because I'm okay. looking at so, no, okay. I'm I'll, I'll give the microphone away now. It's not happening. Um, yeah. But it'd be interesting. I can get anaesthetist in and sort of go and then wake them up and go, how was that experience? And they go, I don't remember anything. It'd kind of be useless, wouldn't it? But it'd be, it'd be funny. It's just it we'll get audience members in to walk around the sort of anaesthetized body and go, oh, this is fantastic. I um, mean, you can do whatever eroticism to them you want. It'll be kind of. Um, I'm trying to <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. You really hate you know, bodies, it, you? Yeah. you know, sticking, putting people back into the womb or something, suspending mm -hmm. people in bags for ages and just leaving them there and telling them 10 minutes has passed and they've missed all their lectures. I'm sure there'd be loads of first years that will sign up to that, you know, like whole day experience of sitting in a uh, something or other, or floating people in sensory deprivation tanks and things. Just seeing, it, seeing what sort of illusions and virtual realities and things you go into your head. You know, I'm, I'm looking to sign up to one of these sensory deprivation tanks. <laughs> because after this, I've been working by myself for who knows how many sort of weeks, and it kind of drives you crazy. So it's, <laughs> um, it would be good to sort of get away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But, you know, I want it to be an experience that is going to help people think about these ideas. Do we really need the body? No. But, I mean, my, 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 yeah, my serious point was that cool. amongst all of this, if, yep. I mean, a, a conscientious way of, uh, of carrying on as you are would always have a mind to, I mean, when you're posting or transcending things, not to transcend that kind of liberatory possibility that I was speaking about. So mm. transcend the liberation, oh, okay, you're saying, yeah. So when you, when you post the, humanism, the liberation of being a morphological idea, being whoever you want to be, you know, like, uh, and don't give me on feminism, but you know, the, the idea of... Um, Back in the 18th, 19th century, women knew their place, men, men knew their place, and we were defined by our place in society. And now, thanks to postmodernism, we can be who we want to be to an extent, but we're still trapped by the body. Um, there's, there's probably a hell of a lot of sort of race uh, arguments. I mean, there's a quote that says, you know, in, in, on the internet, everyone's free to be a white male. Um, and what does that say about, do, do we start removing uh, race and things, but you know, there's, there's all sorts of races and bunnykins on people who run around as big bunnies on Second Life. Um, so, yeah, how would you redesign your body if you wanted to look totally different? I mean, if you could have that much freedom, would you walk around as a, you know, something on the floor? Obviously, evolution has got us here, and this is doing me quite good. But I mean, you can keep going, I suppose. Um, any other questions in the physical world? And then we'll take one from the virtual world, if anyone's still there. Okay, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, sorry, hi. Hi. Right. Um, I had a question um, just about being able to experience multiple identities. So is it something that you think would weaken us because it would confuse us and we're not, we don't, we, because of our limitations, it would weaken us? Or is it something that you think would strengthen us? Go on to Second Life, sign up as a, as a woman, walk around for five or six days and come back and tell me how it felt. Um, I suppose is the best question for that. I mean, it depends on the person as well. I suppose, um, you know. So you don't think that there's, you don't see a human limitation to be able to experience multiple identities and not have, not come out with psychological problems or other. Issues? The fact is, we don't know. You know, and that is a, that is a big sort of like, whoa, under there somewhere. But we, you know, we don't know. But let, let's sort of push doors and try and find out how it would feel. And stick in a sensory deprivation tank and see if you came up with psychological problems and then go, oh, extrapolate that to the future and if we start living in VR with no sensory sense of body, how would that affect us? Um, any other questions, Tim? Um, yeah, the, the use of, of upload, uh, it seems quite a benign term. It's almost as if it's, it's doing a backup <laughs> using a time machine and it's uh, almost a kind of non-invasive procedure. But if, if we're talking about consciousness, either you're, you're suggesting a model where consciousness continues to reside in a person or it's unseemly ripped from them because it contains that which is, is needed to kind of sense everything. But if you take the totality of a consciousness, you're also taking a consciousness that they once were human, mortal, or whatever else you want. And then there must yeah, therefore be a consciousness that you're aware that everything you're now experiencing is not... Um, uh, physical tactile experience but it's been simulated um, and so th there's a sense of loss and is it possible to create a sense of the virtual within the virtual 
you know, at the moment, in this position we're in at the moment, which you might want to phrase as a transitional state, you're able to suggest or theorize or even impart experience some notion of, of a virtual world, yeah. but also then step out of it so you've got some kind of point of contrast. Uh, so that's one point. The other point I would make is this, this uh, I think that the Gibson meat thing was well illustrated, but whether you're talking about a sensory deprivation tank, uh, which then is powered and then requires salts and water and everything else around it, or whether you're talking about a piece of silicon that needs to be um, provided with a lot of power and a lot of cooling, um, you, you've still got this kind of structure around it that constitutes something akin to a body. Yeah. Now, it's a body that in some ways is deficient because you have no control over it. Um, whereas I can affect some degree of reboot. I can go to sleep. I'm in control of a lot of things to do with the, the things that, that keep me upright and make me mobile. Whereas if you're a piece of silicon, you can issue commands, but you're not able to kind of bootstrap yourself. Yeah, and the third point I would make is that um, in the shift to um, the, the virtual, is it conceivable that we would maintain this notion of individuality? You can be who you want to be. If it's premised on optimization, as you kind of suggested in the, the sound piece there, then wouldn't you recognize, as they do with machines, that you cluster machines? You're talking about the power of the network. So this notion of individual, um, <clears throat> uh, separately autonomous objects all kind of put together in one building would, would dissipate towards something where you've got um, a kind of multi-processor notion of something. So it would be more of a kind of communal brain. Kind which of a global, is kind of, global brain. Yeah, all, we is, all share memories. Yeah, and we it's, all sort it's of kind of in, experience in each other's memories. world, it's the notion of Gaia, but in, yeah. in science fiction, it's e and banks and culture and these kind of interconnected machines that have less of an individual identity. Yeah. Um, three points. OK. Um, where do I start? The thing, you know, I, I don't know, full stop. You know, I, I can't predict. I can't predict the future. And um, I'd like to offer yeah. suggestions to the future. You know, that's. Yeah, <laughs> damn. Uh, blast. Maybe I should get a new research topic. Um, uh, realized it now. I went all wrong. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm not. Uh, yeah. Asked, I'm just yeah. No. Yeah. Out. No. It's it's, yeah. it's good points, and it's things that you know I'm gonna have to look at and gonna have to explore. I've got to be careful when I make this because you know you're right about the you're you're confined in the chamber and the interface and you're being told to do something by me to get in this and experience this and it's all instructed to lead to something um, allowing the audience member to have their own sort of experience might be a bit more sort of worthwhile rather than putting rules and regulations on go and sit in that sensory deprivation chamber and tell me what you feel like because um, yeah that is sort of totalitarian to an extent and it's not liberating they can't explore how they would like to explore uh, themselves. Um, I'm just going to take some questions. Um, hello, we're still in the virtual world. Uh, I'd like to take some questions from. Uh, it, would it be possible to take um, some audio questions from the virtual world? Would it be possible to take any questions from the virtual world? All right, thank you. Uh, H R A S T seventy eight. Would you like to do that via sound or via uh, text? Hello, H R A S T seventy eight. Hello. Okay, Sam, okay. Oops. Okay, go ahead. Uh, HR AST78 is your mic on. I think this is Julio. Based on uh, if you just uh, read it in the text chat uh, and just retyped it. 
That's the question from Ahrefs. Uh, isn't the main problem that we don't really know what consciousness is anyway? Maybe consciousness is intrinsically linked to biology. The idea of the miner's machine of uh, input out to devices, etc., is not a good metaphor. But the idea uh, that you can code elements. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know you're right. We don't know what consciousness is, and I'm a theory student, so uh, I mean, study of psychology and know what consciousness is. Um, but I'm just offering a suggestion, um, a possibility of what consciousness might be. And, uh, you know, 15, 16 years down the line, um, or probably more, uh, I find out that, you know, I got it wrong, or at least I, I created a project which sort of alluded to the future, and it was a wrong future. Is that okay, Vienna? Vienna? Is there any other questions from the virtual world before we sort of, uh, I think we would do it. I think we would do better, uh, than that. You don't need to apologize for it, but find another way of explaining it. Um, <laughs> cheers, Anna. Uh, I'll send you my slides. Uh, could you please an edit and annotate? Um, cool. All right. Um, it'd be great to have a chat after this. Um, I'm going to have to pack up sort of this side because we're sort of running over on time. But is there kind of maybe one last question? Possibly from the virtual world? Uh, no, there is no evidence, but it's again, it's conceptual piece possibilities. Right, okay. I mean, feel, feel free to sort of email, if you've got any questions, I'm l.mason.1 at work.ac.uk. And I'd, you know, I'd love to have you guys feedback. I'm going to have to sort of um, pack up here. I'll, I'll continue this on, but I'm going to have to finish the, the lecture as it is. And I'll, I'll have a look at the questions that have been posted further up. And I know there are some questions where the physical audience was here, and I'll try and answer those well, you know. Thank you. Would you like to say anything? Uh, is it Julia? <laughs> no worries. Cheers, guys. Thank you. I'm going to pack up here. And um, if I can get the recording, and I'll... Uh, I'll talk to you guys very well. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Cheers.